Now, again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the brain. I study it myself, I teach it myself. That's pretty much what we talk about most of the time. But to argue that it should be mandatory in all teacher training, which is already narrow, which is already low on time, low on budget, is a little flimsy. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now the article I've selected this week is On the Irrelevance of Neuromyths to Teacher Effectiveness by Horvath and colleagues. Horvath? Wait a second. Did I just select one of my own papers? Yes, I did. Why? Because A, I am clearly an egomaniac, and B, I think we actually all might have something to learn from this. So this whole paper started uh, back in 2009, a researcher named Paul Howard Jones interviewed a bunch of uh, teacher trainers, so new incoming teachers, and he gave them a questionnaire that contained 15 neuromyths. So these were statements about the brain that are wrong, but that many people assume are right. So statements like, uh, we only use 10% of our brain, and if you don't drink six to eight cups of water a day, your brain's gonna shrink. And he wanted to see how many of these neuromyths new teachers believed. So he gives them the survey, and sure enough, a lot of them believed a lot of these neuromyths, just like the rest of the world. So cool, we just discovered that incoming teachers don't have deep, up-to-date knowledge about the brain. Now, Howard Jones and his, his colleagues, they, they ran this survey numerous times over the last decade with different groups of teachers, and they just kept finding the same thing. Novice teachers believed in neuromyths. Now, that's a cool finding, but here's where things get strange. I want to read you a couple sentences from the papers these, these researchers publish, and I want you to see if you can catch the sleight of hand they pulled. So here we go. There is good reason to consider these misunderstandings contribute to poor practice in the classroom. What? So here we have research that shows, cool, people think blank, and then the researchers themselves way misrepresent it and overextend it to say, well, because of this, that's probably why new teachers are all horrible. Ergo, and here was their big uh, climax, you need to include neuroscience in teacher training. Now, don't get me wrong, I ain't against learning about the brain, but I am not about to do it under false pretenses. And this link between belief in neuromyths and teacher practice just didn't make any sense. That's not something we can hang our hat on. So cue this research. So what did we do? So if the assumption is this, people who believe in neuromyths are bad teachers, then there seems to be a pretty easy way to test this. Flip it around. Good teachers, by definition, shouldn't then believe in neuromyths. If neuromyths are the driving factor between effective and ineffective teaching, then surely the best ones wouldn't believe in them. And that's real easy to test. So that's what we did. We went out and we found 50 international educators who had all won international awards for being successful, effective teachers. They had demonstrated their practices good. So here we go. We give this survey to 50 award-winning teachers to see how they think about neuromyths. And what did we find? 13 out of 15 of the questions were nearly identical. Expert award-winning teachers answered exactly the same as novice teachers, which means, uh-oh, it looks like neuromyths might not be the defining factor in what it means to be a good teacher. Now again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the brain. I study it myself, I teach it myself. That's pretty much what we talk about most of the time. But to argue that it should be mandatory in all teacher training, which is already narrow, which is already low on time, low on budget, and say, we also now gotta bring this stuff in, when there's absolutely no demonstrable evidence that that information has any impact on practice, it's a little flimsy. <laughs> But here's where I stand on this. So we give these teachers the neuromyths questionnaire and a lot of them miss them. Cool, this shows that teachers don't have a lot of knowledge about the brain. Great, it's because they're teachers and not neuroscientists. Most teachers, God willing, will go through their entire career without ever seeing their kids' brains. I mean, that's why if, if one of them falls off the playground, maybe on a rare occasion you might see one. But that's not the field of teaching. That's the field of neuroscience. Asking teachers to have deep knowledge of a different field that they will never directly interact with or even be able to measure in their room is questionable at best. Now, the only reason people have ever thrown out is, well, learning happens in the brain, therefore teachers should learn about the brain. And I can't really argue with that, 
but you just gotta keep extending it to see how absurd it gets. Yes, learning happens in the brain, but we have a lot of evidence that show that learning happens here too. It's not just in here, it's all throughout this. So why don't we give incoming teachers biology classes as well? And wait a second, the brain is made out of neurons, so why don't we give them an organic chemistry class as well? Because clearly, if you know neurons, that's gonna help you. But wait a second, neurons are made of molecules, ergo they need to know physics. Believing in physics myths is no different than believing in neuroscience myths when it comes to the practice of teaching. Now, of course, if you're explicitly teaching physics or neuroscience, then that's a totally different issue. But of what practical importance could neuromyths ever have on, say, teaching science or math? For instance, do you really think that a teacher who believes we use 10% of the brain would somehow use different techniques or strategies than a teacher who believes we use 20% of our brain or 30% of our brain? And furthermore, if you think we need six cups of water a day or else our brain shrinks, that might inspire you to buy your kids water bottles, but that says nothing about how to teach history or music. Look, in the end, the practices of one are really far removed from the specifics of another. So as much as I love the brain, I just want you to know what this means is anyone who comes out talking about neuromyths, most of the time they're trying to make you feel bad. Oh, you don't know this about the brain, therefore you're not gonna be a good teacher. Nonsense, do not let outside researchers come in and say, hey, you need my knowledge to do your job. We can collaborate, we can interact, we can share left and right, but do not let anyone like this come in and say, you're horrible because you don't know what I know. That's trash, that's nonsense, that belittles the field and that embarrasses the heck out of me as a researcher. So the next time you come across neuromyths, enjoy them the same you would a celebrity quiz online. It has about that much meaning when it comes to your practice. When it comes to what does it mean to teach, you are the experts. Do not let anyone think or act like that is not the case. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you're all well. I hope you learned a lot from that. And again, if you like what you've heard, if you could please just give me a like and then subscribe uh, beneath. That'll make sure more people on YouTube get a chance to see this stuff. Otherwise, I hope you're all well and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye y'all.